A number of years ago, we had the good pleasure to begin working together, Frank and I did, or at least it was a pleasure for me. And he's been very helpful in the work here. I don't, I don't know if I've helped him, but he's helped me much. And Frank uh, Williams is, uh, is a fine man. I just wish his health were better than it is. Uh, he could do a lot more work for the Lord. He does a tremendous amount as it is with his health being what it is. We're very pleased to have him here with us working. And I'm looking forward to another fine lesson from him at this time. Frank, has, uh, his son is here, and his son will be speaking right after him. And we're, we're proud of him as well. Frank, would you come to us and preach to us God's word? I am delighted to be with you tonight and to start this series of lessons. As we were talking about, we had 10 subjects and we had to come up with uh, a beginning and an ending. And so I do the beginning and the ending. And so you get the best on the first and the last. Something like that. <laughs> Obviously, if we're gonna talk about the church and the fact that the church is not growing at the same rate, and those are key words now, we're not saying the church is not growing. We're saying it's not growing at the same rate as it had in earlier years. Uh, it seemed to me like we could not just make that statement, that we had to prove it. And so the first lesson uh, is going to be proof that the churches of Christ are not growing at the same rate as in earlier years. I'll define what we mean by earlier at a later time. I associate the, what we're doing with the activity of the church in Jerusalem which Luke described in Acts chapter 8, verse 4. Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. That is what we are doing today. We may not be scattered abroad as they were, uh, but we are nevertheless scattered abroad. Uh, there are churches of Christ, again, throughout the world. And tonight we'll be focusing on the churches of Christ in America. Uh, but we are scattered as a people uh, for different reasons than they were but nevertheless, as we go, we are to preach the Word of God. I want to give a uh, disclaimer statement in regard to the numbers in which I'll be using. There is no earthly headquarters for the Church of Christ, uh, which has authority to speak for the Church of Christ. No person, no group, or any group of people have the authority to speak for the Church of Christ. Churches of Christ are autonomous body, making their own decisions under the authority of Christ uh, and the Apostles of Christ. And so there are no headquarters. That poses a problem when we talk about church growth. And it is very difficult then to get numbers uh, of how many congregations there are. And we're talking about in America. It is very hard to find out how many members in those congregations there are. Some congregations, again, get these little questionnaires and they throw them in the trash can and so they don't respond. Others never change it. That is, if they had 75 members 10 years ago, they still got 75 members, even though they got 13 attending. In other words, they just don't respond or they don't make changes. So numbers are a problem. And so there are no real absolute numbers. Those who deal with this do their very best, and I believe they've been very honest in it. And when they have found problems, they have notified uh, or noticed that or talked about it. So that's our disclaimer. Now I want to give an open statement, and I want to borrow the words that were of the late V.E. Howard. He says something again in this, uh, which I have to confess, uh, I had not uh, thought of in the terms in which he has. First of all, he says, the church of Jesus Christ is non-denominational. Now I've thought of that. Neither is it Catholic, I thought of that. Neither Jewish nor Protestant, and I understood that. But then when he says, it is not founded in protest of any institution, and it is not the product of a restoration or reformation, and if it's not that, then what is it? He says it is the product of the seed of the kingdom grown in the hearts of men. That's what the kingdom is. No man started it. We only preach the gospel, and therefore we have converts when they are honest and they obey it. And particularly that last uh, statement, it is the product of the seed of the kingdom and we could say the seed of the kingdom of God 
uh, grown in the hearts of men. That's what we're talking about. And so we need to understand that as we deal with it. It is my obligation tonight because here is my proposition. The churches of Christ in America are not growing at the same rate as they did in earlier years. Again, it's one thing to say that, another thing to prove that. And so I'm going to take you on a long journey when we get started. I have uh, worked under the, the idea that as goes the proposition, so must be the demonstration. Now, I've made the proposition that churches of Christ in America are not growing at the same rate in which they had in earlier years. Now I've got to prove that to you. And so how do we do it? First, the efforts of the restore, uh, efforts to restore the ancient order of things. And I've kind of attached onto that, uh, those words. They come, of course, from Earl West, who did a great research on the uh, effort of restoring, as we would say, or planning by means of the seed of the kingdom of God at the church in America. It is a search for the ancient order. This is what was in the hearts and the minds of those who started uh, all of this. James O'Kelly was one of the first Americans he may not have been the first, but he was one of the first, who lit the fires in search of the ancient order of things. They had no idea where they were going to go. They just knew there was one means to get there, and that would be the Word of God. That would take them to where they were seeking the search for the ancient order. They wanted to find and to live by, be governed by, the ancient order. By ancient order, we mean the New Testament. But they had no idea what was going to be involved in their efforts. On December the 25th, 1793, when was America's birthday? 1796. I want to get the time frame. We are very early in the history of America. In 1792, James O'Kelly and about a half a dozen other people were in attendance at a Methodist conference. It was a somewhat hostile situation because of the attitude toward the Word of God that James O'Kelly and this half a dozen other people had in regard to the Methodist Church. They walked out, and with that, in essence, began back to the Bible. That is what they wanted. Again, they knew not where it was going to take them. They knew not what they were going to have to give up. They didn't know what they were going to have to start doing, but they were headed in the right direction. James O'Kelly, again, was one of the first Americans who lit this fire as we look at it. And so here is, a, again, a photo. We'll have some of those as we go along. But there were others who joined the names of James O'Kelly as he moved forward. There is Elias Smith, Abner Jones, and Rice Haggard, who was one of those with James O'Kelly. They, too, had the same thoughts and the ideas. It was back to the Bible, in search of the ancient order. And so and then a second group of searchers for the ancient order would join themselves again to uh, these uh, men. This, uh, this would be Barton W. Stone, Thomas and Alexander Campbell, father and son, Walter Scott, again to name another. They move forward to restore the search, again, search for the ancient order of things. Then there is no longer, or is at some point, it was no longer a search for the ancient order as you have an empty room and you move furniture into it, or you are putting one thing at a time into it, you may have to, in fact, move some things out because you've got the wrong furniture. So it was with their efforts to, in search of the ancient order. But as they found things in the New Testament, they inserted those again and began to practice those, and that is the way it was. We soon found churches of Christ springing up over young America. I want to show you the population of America in 18... Uh, 80. Uh, this is important. When we think of America, we think of at least the 48 states, or we call the continental, or words, those all connected. And it's kind of hard to get that out of our mind. Even when we're studying history, we still have that implanted in our mind. Well, that's not the way it was. Here is America in 1880. You can see, and I will uh, venture to point here if I can. Ah. This dark area, very small now, that population was, had 45 or over people per square mile. How many people do we have in a square mile just around uh, barns? Uh, maybe more or less. But again, we were not heavily populated. The other area, in other words, this area, I had, uh, again, uh, 0 to 45. And I may have, okay, 
And this other area, way back over here, again, was six per square mile. Six people per square mile. So when we talk about the search for the ancient order, when the preaching began, and they started out again to preach and teach, it wasn't done in a vacuum. Newspapers were available. They didn't have television, the internet, and telephone, and all that, but they had newspapers, and it was a very close-knit society. What you did was well known. That was an aid in the effort to search, in their search for the ancient order. <clears throat> it helps when you go the right direction. <clears throat> Let me give you just a note of interest as we connect some of these names. Uh, according to Martin W. Stone, again, one of those second tier uh, searchers, in his paper, The Christian Messenger, uh, he wrote of James O'Kelly and Rice Haggard, who officially again joined them at the Cane Ridge meeting. And so, again, they weren't all together a little group over here and another one over here who didn't know things. They came in contact with each other and they found out that they were interested in the same thing. And so, with this, the earliest. Uh, search for the ancient order again is joined by a second group and I have again these we have on the top row James O'Kelly uh, Elias Smith and Abner Jones and then we have uh, Stone Thomas Campbell Alexander Campbell and I searched to find a young Alexander Campbell I realized that he looked older than his father in these so I had to say that won't work and then there is Walter Scott and then Raccoon John Smith these are the, again the identities of these uh, and there were many others. These are just the ones we know by name. But there were many more, and they were in search of the ancient order, and they planted the Church of Our Lord in America, all over this young nation. The membership in 1832 was 22,000. Now, we have to kind of look at this, because as we back up, uh, there really is no numbers uh, from the beginning. And so I just started with an arbitrary zero. You'll see this in the book. Or we have no numbers, so we just started. And I backed up, and this means in the first 32 years, starting with 1800, there were about 688 people converted every year. That's not many, but then America did not have many. Again, it wasn't a great populated country. By 1860, membership had grown to 192,000. This was an increase of 6,071 per year from that 32 number. In 1890, membership again continued to grow and it's growing rapidly. I tried to do percentages, but that wasn't in my skill level. But we got to 6,041 6, and 5,100. Uh, again, 20,728 per year converts. Quite remarkable, isn't it? in a young America, densely populated. By 1900, the membership had grown to 1,120,000. That's a yearly increase of 47,895. Again, remarkable without television, telephone, radio, and internet, isn't it? They put us to shame in one sense then. Keep in mind, the, uh, as we look at this now and the numbers, when we get to 1900, we have to realize there is a division taking place that has been going on for the last 50 years. From 1849, really, or 47, to 1900, the Churches of Christ and what is known as the Disciples of Christ were dividing. There became some issues that became very prominent, issues in which were not biblical, and division had to occur. The membership in 1906 was 1,142,359. Again, that's an increase, and notice the difference. Only 3,727 per year. That's what division does. It hinders our effort to reach the loss. But that is the result. The United States Census Bureau beside, decided to do a religious census in 1906. This was the new thing. And again, it really didn't get completed for a little time. But this is really when the division was recognized. It wasn't members of the church who stood up and said, we are two bodies. It was the religious senses who discovered as they went around taking their senses that there was a group called the Disciples of Christ and there was another group called the Churches of Christ and they were divided. 
where at one time they had unity, now they were divided. They recognized the difference. David Lipscomb simply acknowledged it. Division was finally formalized or finally recognized. It was apparent, again, to God-loving people already. And I want to talk about the issues, and I don't know how, I may take all of Benjamin's time. There was disagreement over the centralized organizations above the local congregation. There was something larger than the local church. The New Testament doesn't know of any such. Such as the missionary societies, and then national conventions were going on. Second, the issue of instrumental music in the, the 50s through the 60s, and then on, were producing division among the churches of Christ. As early as 1849, L.L. Pinkerton denied the inerrancy of the Bible. And you can see why there's a problem. But there were other issues. And I want to point out to you the issues they had, we are having today. They're still with us. Still doing the same thing. Pinkerton, again L.L., also supported open membership, recognizing members as individuals, again, who had not been immersed, sprinkled, or whatever. Then there was the rise of women leaders in the temperance and the missionary movements, primarily in the North. And in 1889, in Erie, the Erie Christian Church confirmed leadership role of a woman, again, uh, ordaining her, and she became the first preacher in the disciples' movement in 1889. Division between the disciples of Christ and the churches of Christ, again, formally recognized in 1906. Division and growth from 1906 forward. The disciples, and I want you to notice this carefully, membership numbered, this is after the division, 982,701. Churches of Christ were one, one, 159,000. 658. The difference between, again, the disciples and the churches of Christ stood at 823,043 in their favor. The churches of Christ lost buildings and schools operated by members, and again, but it was all a matter of truth. Shall we or shall we not follow the authority of Christ? Division was then necessary as we look at it. Following the division, Again, we want to follow the growth pattern. Growth in the churches of Christ was slow. They remember what all they had to do. But grow they did. They didn't throw up their hands and quit. They grew. Starting with a membership of 159, 658 in 1606. By 1926, membership had reached 433,714. In 1936, membership had reached 558,000. That number may have been rounded off there. I'm sure there was a one out there somewhere. In 1946, membership had reached at 682,000. You see the growth? Slow and steady, but growth. Then, we got the big head. I'm going to give a little historical perspective. In the late 50s through the 60s, Churches of Christ were reported, and I remember this personally, as one of the fastest, if not the fastest, growing religious uh, group in America. And we felt real proud. But I want to give you some truth on the matter. The estimates in the mid-60s put a total membership at 2.5 million members. Enormous. From 1906 to the mid-60s, an increase of 2,340,302 2, 2, members. What a jump in a short period of time. But the numbers, my brethren, were inflated. Highly inflated. That's a Barrett Baxter, and I mean no disrespect for him, and M. Norval Young. Baxter was the speaker on Herald Truth. M. Norval Young was associated with Pepperdine. I don't remember his uh, position there. Each indicated the figures they reported. In other words, when asked how fast or how much of the churches are growing, they asked these two people. I don't know why they were stuck with it. But they gave an answer. 
And they gave an estimate. Not actuality, but an estimate. They put the figures in which they submitted simply, they added a 10% growth rate. Well, that's not outrageous, is it? But that's how we got to be the fastest growing church in America. And therefore, the hard truth, the churches of Christ, more than likely were not the fastest growing church in America in the 1960s. I remember, again, those times so well. Now, here's a point of interest. It is, again, the greatest interest in the words of Flavel Yakely in his work dated September of 89. He wrote, the number of congregations reported in the yearbook of 1951 was 14,500. He said reported, now that's key. By 1959, that number had grown to 16,500 congregations. Just one year later, the number had grown to 17,500. You can see a rapid growth unheard of in Churches of Christ since the first century. In 1962, it reached a high point of 18,680 congregations. The report. Yakely continued now. In the midst of the 1960s, the total number of membership of Churches of Christ, again, was estimated to have reached 2.5 million. After that, the report began to moderate. I say you should say reports there. In 18 or 1980, however, the yearbook was still reporting 17,000 congregations. Now pay attention. Flavel Yakely sums up uh, these numbers. He says churches of Christ have never had that many congregations in the United States. This is what he does. He, do, he searches and deals with these numbers. If the churches of Christ never had 17,000 congregations, then it stands the reason that the churches of Christ never had 2.5 million people, members. That just seems logical to me. The churches of Christ never had that 17,000 congregations, and the churches of Christ never had that 2,500,000. And so that we are left with the real numbers of this period of time that there are none. I could not find any, again, uh, that, that were reliable because of that exaggeration. But let's go on. 1970 to 1980. Attention now turned to the year, these years and church growth. Mac Lynn did a survey in 1980 of the Churches of Christ and counted 12,762 congregations, not 17,000, and a membership of 1,601,600. 1,601,661 members, not the 2.5 million. Yakely was right. The Churches of Christ have never had, again, 17,000 congregations. And so we never had that 2.5 million members. Oh, we would have liked to, but it just wasn't truth. In the 1980s, a debate arose Again, in the use of command, example, and necessary inference as the model of identifying the essentials of the faith once delivered. What are we having today? Same debate. Some argued that it well established, again, hermeneutic fostered legalism and advocated instead a new hermeneutic. This produced a break in fellowship, if not an outright division among congregations. You can't go in two directions at the same time. As the old preacher used to say, he'd been to the circus and he'd seen a man ride two horses at the same time, but they were going in the same direction, never one going one way and one going another way. And so division, again, was necessary. Well, from 1980, where? With that problem, where do we go? Question, from the end of the 1980s, where did the churches of Christ go in membership? Remember, we had very uncertain numbers prior to that. From 1980 to the year 2000, the churches of Christ grew at a rate of 2.8%, as best I could determine. When it gets to percents, my math are back in kindergarten. Now notice this, in 1980 to 2006, the growth rate again, 2.5. Now we move forward, six years there, there's a decline. 
Not great, but a decline. This shows, again, a decrease in the rate of growth. But the churches of Christ were still growing. So again, we're not saying that we're not growing. We're saying we're not growing at the same rate. Warning signs. When we become a note of knowledge about the fact that we're not growing like we were. There should be warning signs, but they were not seen. From 1990 to the year 2000. By 1990, the Church of Christ had grown to, to 13,174 congregations and a membership of 1,284,056. A good number, but not the number of 2.5 million. Through the number, though the number of congregations increased by 412, the membership declined, if you caught those numbers. We lost 33. 1,549 members during this 10-year period. I would love to go into how you get, it, get all these numbers. Uh, it's fascinating. But this change should have, again, alerted members and definitely alerted elderships in the churches of Christ. Something is wrong. Maybe there was some comfort in the year 2000 now. Even though the numbers of congregations declined in the year 2000, going from 13,080 to 13,032 minus 48, the membership showed a growth from 1,260,838 to 1,264,152, an increase of 3,284. This is less than 1% of one con convert per congregation in three years <clears throat> in my fuzzy math. At any rate, it would take about 12 years for one congregation to convert one person. <clears throat> Again, fuzzy math. Again, maybe there was comfort in the year 2000, as we just, I think, uh, pointed that out. <clears throat> but I asked the question, can you honestly Call that real growth. It's so small. Yes, growth in one soul is worth all. But we're the churches of Christ, commissioned by Christ, and what were we doing? Where was the evangelism of the churches of Christ during the time we're talking about? Did the churches of Christ have the same mission as did Christ? I'd say as the old preacher used to say, if not, why not? For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That was his mission. And I'm going to talk a lot more about that on Sunday afternoon. But let's go back to 2003 to 2006. The numbers in 2003 show a slight increase. But not enough again to stand up and shout about. The number of congregations stood at 13,155 and the membership at 1,276,621. Now these numbers are, are tongue twisters, believe me. The number of congregations grew by 123. And the membership increase of 12,569 in those three years. And that's good. But would the growth continue over the next three years? What happened? Sadly to say, no it didn't. There were, and again, 2006, 12,963 congregations and a membership of 1,265,844. These numbers reveal an increase in congregations by 195, 92, but a loss in membership. Not sure what was going on. Of 10,777. 2006, 2009. Over the next three years, the question comes to mind, is this decline an anomaly or is it a pattern? In 2009, the record reveals 12,629 congregations and a membership 1,224,404. Yes, it appears the pattern of decline again has been established. It hasn't changed really. By the end of the year 2009, the Church of the Christ lost 334 congregations and 41,440 in membership. 
2009 to 2013. We're getting close. Over the next four years, the number do not get any better. The Churches of Christ lost 193 congregations and lost 14,380 members. Now remember, some die. But we didn't get any back. Over the next six years, from 3000, 2003 to 2009, Churches of Christ had 526 fewer congregations and 78,436 fewer in membership. Now we come face to face with more numbers which show a continuing decline. Again, we're going towards 2013. The latest numbers provided by 21st Century Christian compiled by Carl Royster in December of 2013 are even more revealing. In this publication, they reported the following numbers. The number of congregations stood at 12,436 and a membership of 1,210,024. Now you can't remember all that, so I, again, I try to help. The math tells the story. It's less. It's a decrease. This means, this is why I may not try to help you. Between the year 2000 and 2013, the Church of the Christ lost 596 congregations and 54,128 members. The churches of Christ are not growing at the same rate as it did in earlier years. Again, these are the best numbers that I could locate. Flavel Yakely uh, spoke, no, it was Stafford North, who spoke recently in Oklahoma City in, in the Confirming the Faith, I believe it was. And one of our later speakers, Chris Tanette, was there, and he said that he used the same numbers that I had. I gave him my conclusion. He was asked for it earlier. I think we proved our case. Earlier years, now what would we mean by that? I said I'd get to it. The word earlier is, again, a relative term. You, you have to define it so it's all my obligation. Meaning it must be, again, defined. And here's what I mean. It refers to a period from 1948 to 1999. You say, I'm not shrinking it. I, I got a long period in, in view here. In these years, the Church of the Christ added 2,943 congregations, an increase in membership by 963,473. That's growth. But the last 13 years, 2000 to 2013, the Church of the Christ lost 596 congregations and again declined in membership by 54,128. Earlier and present. Again, even if my math is incorrect, and it might be. <clears throat> Keep your calculator in your pockets. Even by a few. The evidence is clear. The Church of the Christ are not growing at the same rate as they did in earlier years. Are we growing? Yes, ever so slightly. Now as goes the proposition, so must be the demonstration. And I gave the proposition, I believe I have proved it in the demonstration. The best numbers we have. And so conclusion. But we can be discouraged as we look at these facts. And as we come face to face with them. Or we can look up and see the world of opportunity. It's like the person who went to Africa going to sell shoes and one of them said, they don't wear shoes. He saw no opportunity. The other man looked and saw feet unshoes and he was a shoe salesman. It's an attitude. It was during the Roman Empire, Nero, the empire, emperor, one of the most wicked periods of history. No churches of Christ existed. And Jesus said to his apostles, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now what do you think about that? In the world of Nero, zero churches of Christ. He gave them the gospel and said, go preach it to every creature. And the church grew. Do we have it any worse? 
than they did. We have the same gospel, and it will do the same thing today as it did then. Our obligation, as it was then, was to preach it. They that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. That's our obligation. And so I leave you with my favorite verse. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among them which are sanctified. There we are. And what will we do? Thank you very much.